as we're kind of getting back into it, as you guys were discuss discussing and looking at some things, is there anything else that's come up as far as questions, concerns, anything on those topics that, anything that wasn't clear? Had some good questions about mortgage interest rates and checking, please. I've something like credit report and the judgment against me, but I don't have a judgment against me. Sure. Because I have a mortgage and 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 I failing to remember what the exact numbers are, but they said for each credit inaccuracy, it tends to take some, you know, 200 or 300 hours and eight to nine thousand dollars to get those things resolved. Essentially what the problem is, is that someone has incorrectly reported a judgment against you, that judgment should go against somebody else. Now the, the person that has that lien they don't want to let you off the hook, even though you don't deserve to be there, until they can just transfer the lien to someone else. They don't want the lien just floating. And so they tend to say, oh, thanks for informing us. Okay, it's a mistake. We'll, we'll get on that next Tuesday of 2016. Okay, so that's kind of the game that they tend to play. And you're over here saying, come on, man, I got to buy a house. I got to buy a car. I'm, I'm doing these things. I'm trying to work through this process here. And so that's, that's where the, the challenges are. If you've got a good lawyer, that's probably your best bet. And uh, I wish there was a more simple way to actually get it all resolved. Basically what you need is you need the person that put that lien on to say this lien should not be there. That needs to be in writing. Once you get that letter or that note from the lender or the lien holder, you'll, use the, you'll take that and you'll add it to a, a form that you can find on the... Uh, um, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion website. You get a hundred word explanation, which can be as simple as, this is not mine, I didn't do this, and here I have proof from the lien holder that says, release the lien, we got the wrong guy. Once you have those two things, you can send it in. If you just send in the hundred word explanation and say, this isn't me, they're gonna send you back a letter that says, sorry, you get to work that out with the lien holder. All that goes round about to say, yeah. Unfortunately, it's costing you time and money, but um, it's kind of how it works. I wish I had better news for you. I hope it doesn't take too long. I hope you've got a good lawyer. Sure. No, that's exactly what I did, and I said, this isn't me. And they said, we're not, then we're not on your credit report. And I said, I'm looking at my credit report. You're on my credit report. And they said, then you have an account with us. And I said, okay, but I'm me and I know me and I don't have an account with you. And they said, so, because then we're not on your credit report, they said. And I said, but I'm looking at it and you are on there. Do you see the circular argument there? That went on for hours. It was bad, right? And so that's, that was the problem. They kept saying, well, you have to give us your account number for us to resolve this. And I said, it's not my account. I don't have an account number. They said, well, what do you expect us to do? And I said, I'd like you to get off my credit report. <laughs> and they said, well, you can't even give us an account number. What are we supposed to do about that? And I literally went on. Okay, eventually I found out who it was, what had happened. We sent a letter. They said, we'll look at it six months later. They didn't look at it. We finally, I got together with the individual. We walked into the branch together, sat down with the highest ranking person that we could summon and said, this is a mistake and it has to be resolved before we walk out the door. And uh, fortunately, again, after years of working on this, we found someone that was willing to listen. I, I, again, I, I, same sentiment, I wish I had better news for you on that, but golly, it's just, it's not an easy process. It's really a shame. And again, mine was innocent, harmless, nobody meant to make a mistake, but um, it was just some simple numbers that got switched up and there was an oops and it took I, again, I can't count the hours. And my blood pressure is rising as I talk about it because... Okay, so as we get going into this, just as far as kind of keeping on track with uh, what we're working on here, um, again, who are, the, who are the student mentors in here? So you answered some good questions. Oh, student mentors, those are you guys. You guys had some good questions. Well done, okay. Uh, so as far as the student mentors are concerned, they'll be here afterwards for a few minutes to answer your questions. Um, at the end, after I finish module six, we're going to go over the eight financial
priorities real quick and I'll ask that everybody just take a moment to kind of skim over those with your spouse, your significant other that's here. Look over those and use that as a little way to kind of set some goals, right? So this is the, this is the ending one, so we want to wrap this up appropriately. Are we good? Okay, I will move through this as efficiently as I can to keep us as on time as possible. Are we ready on the video? Great. Okay. Can you edit this, by the way? Can you edit out the dumb things I say? Can you make me look really good? I'm kind of confined to a small space here. I can't move around as much as I like to. Okay, so module six, here's the final module in the series, having adequate insurance protecting you and your loved ones. even in the midst of some technical difficulties. Okay, so as far as our, we're going to start again with financial uh, perspectives, read some quotes by prophets and apostles here, talk about insurance basics, personal insurance, property insurance, and then finish up with some employee benefits here. Uh, this tends to be an area of great interest, especially in today's environment where there's a lot of concern and a lot of information, uh, some good, not some, not some not quite as good on health insurance in particular. So we'll touch on that just a little bit. Uh, financial perspectives as far as tithing is concerned. We all know this Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 as far as uh, on tithing. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven. And this is a window. Now interesting that we would use this particular quote when we're talking about insurance. Now, I don't think Malachi was simply talking about financial benefits. I don't think that he was simply saying, if you pay your tithing, you're going to have all kinds of money fall out all over the place. I think perhaps part of the perspective here is that if we are full tithe payers, we will be blessed in all areas. And maybe one of those great blessings, frankly, might be not having to use these insurance products. It might be avoiding some of the, the downsides that can come. Paying tithing first shows that we put the Lord first in our lives. It doesn't say that if we pay our tithing, we'll get all the financial blessings we need, regardless of learning, thought, application, hard work, and effort on our parts. Does the Lord expect us to pay tithing? Yes, He absolutely does. Might I also suggest to you that He expects us to balance our checkbooks? that he expects us to be wise stewards. I will spare quoting you the entire section, but in my scripture reading, I just finished reading D&C section 104. If you haven't read that, perhaps I might suggest that as an extra family home evening lesson or something to look at. The word stewardship is used almost a dozen times. They talk about debt from the church, but I think it has great personal application. Those are the types of blessings that we're seeking. So, the prophet Malachi did promise that God will open the windows of heaven. Again, no promise that that simply means financial blessings. It does not mean we're eliminated from financial challenges, right? This is not a celestial world. We're here to be tested. We're here to be proven. Again, maybe I could just, speaking off the, off the script a little bit, but maybe the blessing, one of the great blessings, is to know that the Lord will simply look out for us during the hard times, as long as we're honest and pay a full tithe. So there are more commandments that we need to worry about. There are commandments, and in fact, we have quotes by prophets, a lot that we can look up, that deal with building a reserve. We read one by President Hinckley at the beginning of the last module that talks about that. Preparing for retirement, missions, and educations. In fact, husbands, as we are commanded to be the primary providers for our home, I know that there are some less than ideal circumstances where things don't always work out that way for short periods of time, but that's one of the roles that we play. And that obligation to provide financially for our families does not end even if we pass away prematurely. It's an obligation that we have that continues on. And so understanding how to protect and secure our families against the unintended consequences 
and frankly some of the nasty stuff that just happens as part of the world we live in. It's part of our financial responsibility, but husbands, again, it's part of our priesthood responsibility, something that we should take very simple, or very, not simply, uh, very seriously. Insurance basics. First of all, don't insure the small stuff. Buy broad coverage and shop around and buy direct if possible. Cut out the middleman. First of all, don't insure the small stuff. Can we insure anything these days? Absolutely. Who here, as, for example, has been offered an insurance plan on your cell phone? They're there. All of your providers will offer it. It's all there. Insurance is all over the place. Extended warranties when you buy anything these days, right? You go into any store and buy something, you're going to find something about an extended warranty. Kind of works the same way as an insurance product. So what should we be insuring? Well, if, if you consider this, there's a couple of things that we ought to look at. First of all, we ought to look at the frequency of loss. And then we ought to look at the severity of loss. Okay? If the frequency of loss is low, but the severity of loss is high, those are the types of things we're working that we should look for insurance on. Example, uh, your house burning down in a fire. What is the frequency of loss? How often does that happen? Com is it common or not too common for, e for each of us? Not too common, right? What's the severity of loss? Your house burns down, what do you lose? Everything, right? Okay, frequency is low, severity is high. Do we consider insurance? Yes, yeah. Uh, what about uh, from a life insurance perspective? This is a young group here. What is the chance that any one person in this year, tragic as it would be, will pass away this year? It's relatively low, isn't it? And yet, for you, as you consider your spouse and your family, what would the severity be? The, the economic impact would be high. Do we consider life insurance then? Absolutely. Okay. Personal injury, health insurance. Hopefully, the frequency of a major health event is relatively low, but the severity would be indeed quite high if there is a major catastrophe. So we consider health insurance. Going back to the cell phone, do we insure these? What's the frequency of loss? So for some of you, it's high. I think that you should get a chain and just tie it to your belt or something if that's the case. There are other ways to actually deal with that. Okay? And yet the economic impact, you know what, if I lost this, I could get by. Not the kind of thing I need to worry about for insurance. So we're talking about the big stuff here. Buy broad coverage, so when we find something that needs to be insured, we should insure it as completely as, co uh, as possible, and then shop around and buy direct. If you can avoid going through a middleman, you'll end up usually getting the insurance for a cheaper rate. You'll save yourself money. Uh, online resources are great for this. Question. What do you recommend with renters insurance that's called students instead of, um, I guess it's covering more of the renters? Yeah. With, with renter's insurance, that's an interesting one. You say, what's the frequency of loss? Probably low. So the question to me then would be, what's the severity of loss? Now, if, if your apartment is like most college student apartments, and frankly, you got your furniture from DI and everything else from DI, one might suggest that if you had a complete loss, maybe it wouldn't be that catastrophic for you and an extra thousand dollars in an emergency fund could kind of get you back up on your feet if there was a major loss. On the flip side, renter's insurance tends to be very, very inexpensive, as little as 10 to 12 dollars a month for reasonable coverage. And so I'd say if you have things in your apartment that are of value, uh, if the loss would be quite severe and difficult for you to overcome, then I think that renter's insurance is something that you ought to look at. Does that give you, is that a good answer for your question? Thank you. Anything else? On those? Okay. Quick, one question. Real quick. Please. Uh, so, it seems like a lot of the durable things these days, the, you know, things we buy for homes like the fridge and the stove and washer and dryer, and all those things are kind of designed to burn up. Planned uh, obsolescence. Yeah. So, how do you. How Isn't do you it scary, that? incidentally, that there's a term for that? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, how do you deal with that? As far as, as, far as that goes, I, 
use consumer reports, use good information out there, and the way that, that my wife and I have chosen to deal with it is to buy stuff that's as quality as it can be. But simply stated, if you actually look at those extended warranties and things like that that they'll offer, the companies offer you those deals because they profit from it. Not because it's economically beneficial for you, it's economically beneficial for them. In fact, there are some cases where that's all the profit that they make. They sell the good at cost and make money based on the warranty. I suppose if you're accident prone or, or you, you know that you're very hard on your equipment, uh, you might consider it, but the, the math just doesn't work out on those things. So I'd say where you can buy quality equipment, buy stuff that will last for as long as you think it reasonably can, and then avoid the warranties because you just don't need to pay those costs. Other questions? Okay. Perhaps the greatest movie of all time. Okay. On our list of family classics, incidentally, uh, Groundhog Day. <laughs> skip ahead to get rid of the, ooh, where did the music go? There it is. Okay, I heard some of you quoting that as it was up there, right? That's not a generational thing, that's a classic, okay? If you haven't seen it, there's something wrong with you, not me, okay? <laughs> do insurance agents get a bad rap? Yeah, they do, honestly, right? They get a bad rap. Is it warranted? <laughs> I hear people, yes, absolutely. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Here's, here's the issue as far as insurance is concerned. The same with housing. It goes back to you finding the right product for you and your family. It goes back to control, to you getting what serves your needs and not simply contacting you and, or contacting an insurance agent and saying, what can you sell me today? Okay, if you do that, they're probably going to sell you what's in their best interest, not yours. That's a problem. Okay, a little bit of work on our end will help to solve those problems, right? And I would say that again, insurance agents, they do tend to get a bad rap, but I have life insurance for my family and I'm certainly grateful that there are good people out there that are willing to sell it because it's a product that, uh, that many of you, I think, will find that you actually need. Now, your most important asset, right here, it's your family. That's not my family, it's your family. It's actually not your family. Your most important asset is your family, okay? So how do we protect our families? And this goes back to what we're trying to protect from is an unintended income shock, right? We all have these financial lives kind of planned out, okay? And again, I'm a financial planner, okay? So this is what I, you know, 20 years ahead is kind of how I like to think of things. So as we're moving along, 
this plan set up, and where in my plan do I account for the fact that like one third of working adults in the US today, I may become disabled for three months or longer? Do I plan for that? That's not in my plan. I'm not planning on getting hurt, and yet one out of every three people in this room will become disabled at some point, unable to work for at least three months. Something that we ought to consider. Okay? How do we insure for something like that? Disability. Okay? The unfortunate reality of the world we live in is that people pass away prematurely. Now, my wife and my family, they're dependent on me for an income stream. And if I pass away before I'm supposed to, what happens to that income stream? It's gone. And so how do we protect against that? Life insurance, right? And then the other thing, of course, and I know that we've all seen this in lives of family and friends, people get sick, people get hurt, and people need medical attention. And the costs of dealing with some of these major medical issues can sink a family financially. Hopefully it doesn't sink you spiritually, but it can sink you financially. So here's the first three that we'll start to talk about how to protect our families with health, life, and disability insurance. Okay, starting with health, first of all, uh, obviously can be devastating to your family's uh, finances. Things to look for in a plan, and again, an area of big flux right now. Major medical coverage, the big stuff, okay, the heart surgeries and things like that. Uh, you want to consider also the choice of providers. You know that many hospitals and doctors have banded together in groups these days. And so you want to consider the group, who can you access for medical care? Obviously, this is one where sit down with your spouse and consider your unique needs. I can't tell you, and frankly, no one on the street can tell you what the best insurer for you is, because we don't know your medical history. I don't know what you need. If you're aware of a medical condition, then you ought to seek a group that actually covers that. Lifetime maximums. Most health plans have a lifetime maximum, so once you hit that, they won't pay anything else out. And it's amazing how quickly, with one or two major events, one can hit a maximum of even a million dollars. So making sure there's an adequate lifetime maximum is important there too. Deductibles and copay. Simply stated, a deductible is the first amount of money that goes towards a claim and it comes out of your pocket. A copay is how costs are split after that. So a simple example might be if I have a health insurance plan that has a $500 deductible and an 80-20 copay. And I go in for a medical procedure and I discuss it with my doctor beforehand and I say, what are the costs of this procedure? Because you would always do that, right? Right? right. No? Yeah. You just go have the procedure and wait for them to send you a bill? We may want to rethink that philosophy just a little bit, okay? So I'm in with the doctor, I'm discussing some costs, and the doctor says the procedure is expected to be, oh, say, for the sake of easy math, $10,500. Okay, so we get the bill for $10,500, and the first thing I need to do is I pay my deductible, $500. That comes out of my pocket. And then the rest of the bill is split according to the copay. In this case, 80-20. And so for the $10,500 procedure, I'm going to pay roughly $2,500, and the insurance company is going to pay $8,000. That's how it is split up. Now, when we get into talking about premiums and things like that, you'll notice that a higher deductible and higher co-pays means lower premiums, right? The more risk you are willing to take on, the less you have to pay for it in this case. Uh, and then the last part is guaranteed renewable, a unique feature of, closet, a unique feature of some insurance products that you'll want to check out. If it's not guaranteed renewable and something happens, you're being treated, your coverage expires, and they don't have to renew you, guess what? If you're being treated for cancer, do you think they're just going to re-up your coverage? You're shaking your head, no, I agree with you, they're probably not. And if they do, what are they going to charge you? A whole lot more, okay? So guaranteed renewable is something that we want to watch out for uh, with life insurance as well, incidentally. Okay, so the process of buying health insurance here. First and foremost, try to get it through your employer. 
This is a benefit that's becoming, frankly, increasingly more difficult to find really good health insurance through employers. Frankly, the rising cost of health insurance is making it very difficult for providers, for employers to provide you with the type of coverage that they might have for your parents or in generations past. So first of all, employer, incidentally, one other caveat here, for those that are looking to graduate here and you're going on to look for your first job, I would recommend that you consider health insurance as part of the overall employment package. We tend to look at things and compare job offers just based on salary, right? $40,000 salary, $40,000 salary, they're equal. What if one actually has better health insurance? It'll save you money in the long run. Obviously something that you should consider. Okay, second of all, look for any specialized type of group that you may belong to where you could get a group insurance. Insurance is going to be cheaper when we can tap into what's called the law of large numbers. More people in a pool makes it more likely that that pool will behave as statistics would imply and therefore costs go down. So if you can't get it through your employer, you're looking for another group or organization that you can get it for or from. And then last but not least is buying individual coverage. This is your last option because typically it's the most expensive way to do it. Often I found that people, young people in particular, end up being priced out. It's just difficult to find affordable coverage this way. If that's your situation, then you may end up looking for the last bullet point there, which is a high deductible health plan. It's kind of a health plan where, again, well, high deductible, maybe of $5,000. So you're going to pay out of pocket up to $5,000, and then they split everything after that. Okay, those, again, maybe not the best insurance, but they tend to be affordable for younger people. So I have a question about this, um, and some other people may be in a similar situation. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, for instance, I've accepted a job, but I don't start till September 10th. Sure. And they have a plan, um, and I call BYU's health plan to see how long there's a grace period. And from what I understood from the, from the first person is that there really isn't much of one, so that may be incorrect, but considering the, the fact that that, so BYU could go away, yeah. They, they said I could pay in, but it, it goes up like 10 times or something mm -hmm. for cost. Um, what is the best option to bridge that time through the summer up until you know, I'm on that new plan? Excellent question. Okay, so just to repeat it and to make sure I understand it correctly, you're here at BYU, you're on a student, uh, a student plan. BYU, incidentally, is one of the very few academic institutions in the country that has a unique plan like this just for students. Okay, so you're, you're fortunate to be able to be involved in that type of a plan. You're going to graduate in April. You don't start your job until September. You've got a gap in the summer. You're going to go off and do something stupid and get hurt, so you need coverage. Right? because it's the summer and you do fun things and the more fun you're having, the more likely it is that you're going to get hurt. I wish the camera could see his wife smiling and nodding vigorously that yes, you're perhaps injury prone. Okay, so we've got the scenario there. So what are your options? Uh, if you can continue your BYU coverage and that's under a, a, a program called COBRA, uh, continuing coverage and uh, you can keep moving on there. If you sign up for that coverage before you graduate from BYU, you can continue on that plan, but BYU does not have to subsidize you anymore if they're subsidizing you at all. And so hence when they said that it will increase by tenfold, that's correct because you have to pay that full cost. It tends to be very expensive, but it does allow you to continue on the same plan with no change in your coverage which is an advantage. If you can swing that financially for the summer, that's probably your best bet. Your next challenge would be to go down the list because that's your group plan. So I'd say we'll go back to this list and say, then your next opportunity is to say, is there another group that you belong to? If you were moving to or lived in a state that is setting up one of the new health exchanges as mandated by the Affordable Health Care Act, then you could look at that as an option and weigh the benefits and the costs accordingly. You could also choose to just buy individual coverage, which again would probably be high deductible. Um, you'd pay a lot less than continuing on with your benefits that you're receiving here. 
Um, but you'd probably save some money if you went with the high deductible type plan. What is a, a ballpark deductible, or excuse me, a premium for just a major medical, you know, you, if mm. you like break two legs or something, you know, then you would tap, you might surpass that 5,000 deductible. Like what is a, is a premium for that? Uh, for a high deductible plan? Typically, the high deductible plans that I have worked with are about $5,000 for the deductible. I think the actual bar for what qualifies as high sorry, deductible is My question lower. was the, the monthly premium to, to oh. pay for that. Um, working with a young student last year uh, in a high deductible plan, I saw premiums as low as, I think, $250 per month, which is, which is quite low. But at the same time, I think their deductible was close to $10,000, no maternity coverage, which was an issue for this particular co uh, couple. Uh, the co-pay was, I think, 70-30, and the range of things that they covered was actually quite limited. So rather than looking at that and saying, yeah, can you get health insurance on the open market for as low as, I don't know, $200, $250 a month? Absolutely. The question is, what is it actually covering, right? I'm not suggesting you need some of the more uh, exotic coverage types, like uh, I go to a strange foreign country, I contract a strange incurable disease that hasn't been seen for 100 years and they'll pay for that. If you don't travel, you don't need that kind of coverage. But you can get the low dollar amounts, they're just not gonna cover that much. Did, did that answer your question or have I still missed it? No, that's good. Okay. Any other questions on that? Oh, the question of premiums, that's what it all comes down to. Okay, uh, so moving, moving along here, personal insurance as far as your health is concerned, we don't talk about this often. What's the best thing you can do to avoid costly health insurance? Take preventive measures. Stay healthy, okay? Word of wisdom, it's classic. We, we quote the word of wisdom because we did as missionaries as all the things that you're not supposed to do but the section in the Doctrine and Covenants is a little bigger than that, isn't it? Aren't there some things that we are supposed to do? Don't drink, don't smoke, we know that. Get plenty of rest. Exercise regularly, eat healthy foods, make time for relaxation. In fact, there's a quote from President Hinckley about making sure that we have appropriate time with our families to engage in wholesome recreational activities. If we're doing that appropriately and cost-effectively, I might add, we're actually going to be healthier, and you won't, need to, you won't need to tap into your health insurance as much. Also have regular medical checkups. Annually, you know the things, you know your health, but make sure that you're engaging in that. You do this, you're gonna cut down what you're gonna have to pay as far as health insurance is concerned. Okay, as far as life insurance, moving on to, again, insuring our families and protecting, uh, protecting their well-beings. Um, what we're trying to do, again, is ensure against the loss of income for your family, something that could be devastating there. How much earning potential do you have? That's an important thing to consider as far as life insurance is concerned. What does your family need? As far as, uh, again, going back, let me go back to the basics on life insurance a little bit more. The initial question that perhaps we should be asking is, who really needs life insurance? And I would start to ask that or answer that question by saying, who depends on you? And what debts do you have? What obligations do you have that might continue after you pass away? If you're young, you are unmarried, and you have no debts and no obligations, and so speaking purely economically, your passing away wouldn't be devastating to anyone else economically you might not need life insurance, okay? Now, if you're young and married and you support your spouse and you have some debts, you have a mortgage, you have some other loans that you have to pay for, okay? Life insurance then is something that you consider. If you're young and you have a family and you have children, who's going to provide for those children after you pass away? That's where life insurance comes in. How much to buy? There's a couple different things here as far as rules of thumb are concerned. Uh, notice it says here 10 to 15 times income is recommended. If you're a personal finance or a finance student and you understand time value of money, you can whip out your financial calculator at this point and find the present value of your future earnings. You could find the present value of what you'd like to provide for your family in your absence, and those would be 
acceptable substitutions there. Consider what debts you have. Consider paying off the mortgage through life insurance if you were to pass away prematurely. Any other debts? Uh, establishing college education funds for your kids. Uh, mission funds. Money for your kids to get married, to pay for the wedding. Those are things, all of those things that you might want to provide if you were present. Those are things that you should account for and insure yourself for adequately if you're not. Uh, term versus cash value comparisons. This is a, a fairly large debate. I'll, I'll make it simple, quite simple as I can for this group. Term is probably what you can afford, right? Term is relatively cheap. A personal example, my wife and I have, among the couple of policies that we have, my wife and I have a term policy for me. It's a half a million dollars coverage. It costs us $188 a year. That's not expensive. I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm not in a high risk job. Professor could be a little high risk, we'd like to think so, but it's really not that bad, right? Okay, so that kind of stuff, it's relatively cheap to insure. Uh, a cash value or a permanent insurance product is going to be significantly more expensive. As a brief warning, I had someone come and visit me in my office a couple of weeks ago. They said they wanted me to look at an insurance policy for them. They'd been sold a policy and I said, what is the policy for? We went through some questions and the individual said, this is to give my wife enough money to survive in case I pass away. What was the face value of the policy? How much money might it take for your spouse to survive if you were to pass away? What would make their life a little more comfortable? Well, the face value of this policy that I looked at was $10,000. Now, I just told you I'm paying $188 a year for a half a million dollars coverage. How much was this individual paying for $10,000? Young, healthy, younger than me, probably in good health, paying about $550 a year. How does that make sense? Does that mean that insurance product is bad? I'd suggest that that insurance product was inappropriately used. It was a product that was sold to the wrong individual. So when it comes to people that are young and healthy and trying to get the most bang for your buck, term insurance, it's like your car insurance. You pay for it, it covers you for X amount of time. If you don't lose it, it's a sunk cost and you can decide whether or not you wanna play the game again. The alternative again, cash value or permanent insurance, well, that would be for people that have a permanent need to have life insurance. Who has a permanent need? Who, has, who needs life insurance for their entire life? You're never going to run out. Right? Now, I, again, let me, let me explain a little bit more here. I'd like to hope that at some point we're financially stable enough that if I died, my wife and kids would be fine economically, that they'd be able to move along. I hope that there's a point where I no longer need life insurance because if I do things the way that I should be doing them, they might not have that need, okay? Are there families that do have a permanent need? What are you thinking? Interesting, people that live beyond their means. That's an interesting comment. If you live beyond your means, you're gonna get yourself into some trouble. You could leave your family in a world of hurt. Yes, I'd say that's probably a good one for term insurance. If you buy the permanent stuff, it's gonna to be too expensive and you may end up struggling. Other thoughts, who might need permanent insurance? People that have physical disabilities they would want chronic illnesses. Chronic illnesses, disability in the back? Um, if there's a single parent household. Single parent household, you might need it, you might not. I, I wanna capitalize on this comment here about disability. What about parents of children that have special needs and have challenges that won't go away, right? It's likely that at some point the parents will pass away, but that child, especially if the child can never support themselves, there, may need, there might be a need for permanent insurance. And that's where you might look for some of these cash value and whole life types of policies. Does that make sense? So for most of us, we're probably gonna to default to term unless you have a unique need 
to provide life insurance coverage until the day you die, no matter how long you live. And I'm gonna suggest that that's usually, again, if you have a unique family lead or a unique family need, or if you have some estate issues, estate planning issues that you have to deal with. Okay, on to disability, how to protect your income stream. Disability, similar to life insurance, covers you in case you become disabled, but you don't pass away. Back in 2009, there was an academic study that showed that financial ruin is actually more common among families that go through long periods of disability compared to families with a spouse that passes away. And here's the simple reason why. When somebody passes away, it's true, the income stream stops. There's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of reasons why we don't like that. It's an uncomfortable topic. But the income stream stops, but the expenses also tend to stop. With disability, what happens? One spouse gets, gets disabled, and what happens to the income stream? It stops, and what happens to the expenses? They tend to rise. It's a double whammy. It's something to watch out for there. So it's something that, again, I would recommend considering. Uh, as far as uh, where you can get it through, there's a number of uh, private providers. You can go online. You can find these things. Best place probably to get it is through your employer if they offer it because they'll offer something that's kind of related to your needs in your employment there. Uh, coverage should replace about 60% of your income. If you want it to replace more income than that, you're going to have to pay a little bit more. Uh, and then again, note here at the end, you're more likely to become disabled than die prematurely. Uh, again, one third of the working adults of the adults in this room right here will become disabled for at least three months at some point during your working lifetime. So please don't just gloss over this one and say, I don't need that because the fact of the matter is, is we probably do something that we should look for there. Okay. Uh, property insurance, how do you protect your, protect your property? Homeowners insurance, what losses would be catastrophic? Obviously fire, earthquake, things like that, complete loss. Those are the things that we're looking for. We also want to know what it would cost to replace your home and your contents if you suffered such a loss. Where are you gonna live and what are the costs going to be while you rebuild? These are all things that we need to be looking out for. Uh, a good insurance provider will help you. They have some different metrics that can be used to kind of give you a ballpark on some of these things. Renter's insurance, somebody asked before. I like the idea of renter's insurance in, to some degree for those of you that are young. Uh, if you have stuff in your apartment that you would need to replace, you can look into that. Again, it's relatively cheap. Other types of property insurance, liability insurance. Insurance that you need if you are the cause of some type of accident or injury to someone else. The mailman is walking up your snowy steps that you failed to shovel. He slips and breaks his leg. Whose fault is that? It's your fault, okay? Because you have an obligation to keep your property clean and orderly. Liability is all over the place. And so liability insurance protects you against that. Liability insurance tends to be inherent in many other types of products. Your auto insurance has a liability component. Your homeowner's insurance should have a liability component. If you need more than that, there's a type of policy called an umbrella liability policy. It covers everything else. Okay, so as far as looking into this, I'd be looking for things where if you got sued, if someone's likely to get injured, if things go wrong, you might need some coverage uh, to that point. Some of the liability insurance, when it deals with some of the more broad coverages, it's not overly expensive. Look at what your liabilities are, look at what the things you need to protect against are, and you can go from there. As far as auto insurance is concerned, shop around, shop around, shop around, okay? There's rules number one, two, and three. The next set of rules is when you're shopping around, make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. Saying that this company is cheaper than that may not be good information if the coverage isn't as good, right? If company A is covering half of what company B is, you'd expect to pay less. So make sure that you're actually comparing things directly. My recommendation to you is that you would actually look for auto insurance about every six months. Make a couple of phone calls, See if anything out there is cheaper for the same coverage. 
look and make sure that you need to do some adjustments. If you need them, go ahead and make those at that time. I don't know how it is for you guys, but for me, who has a personal relationship with their insurance providers? Anyone? Is it just me? Who, who knows them? They're living, okay, we've got a couple of hands going up here, right? Perhaps someone in your neighborhood, maybe someone in your ward. I really like the idea of supporting my friends and neighbors, but you know what's really awkward? Is, is if I went and looked and found that I could save $100 every six months on each car if I switched companies, right? So I'm not telling you not to use your friends and neighbors, but just be careful and realize that uh, you may be paying an additional relationship tax there. Just something to, to be aware of. Okay, note the key limits for your liability portions on the insurance, what it'll cover here. There's a little more on that in just a moment. Uh, make sure that you have protection from your family, for your family in case of a lawsuit. Uh, and then uh, down here, let me point this one out. Take as high a deductible as you can reasonably afford. Remember what the deductible is, right? That's the first portion that you pay, okay? And so if you take a higher deductible, your auto insurance premiums are going to go down. You're playing a game with the insurance provider. You're saying, I will take on more risk. If I get in an accident, I will pay more money. And so they're not insuring you for as much, and so your monthly premiums drop. Okay? So if you can do that, how would you account for this? The emergency fund is key here. Make sure that if you have a high deductible, that you have enough money in your emergency fund, and you can save yourself a considerable amount of money. Okay. We'll pause here to do this real quick. Uh, we'll take two minutes now. I realize our, our numbers are declining ever so slightly. Take two minutes here to talk to your spouse and talk about your insurance needs real quick. It's that important. We'll even pause the video. Okay, we'll use this as a quick other break here. Okay, talk with your spouse. What do you need, your significant other? Do you need health insurance? If so, I hope you have it. Do you need life insurance? Do you know who you actually have for auto insurance? Talk about renter's insurance real quick. I'll give you a minute and a half. Okay, you had a minute to talk about it. You had a minute to think things through just a little bit. And so hopefully we've all got a little better idea of what insurance we might need what we, and, and what you might not have, okay? If you need something and you don't have it, set a goal to do it for family home meeting. And go ahead and, and do that as quickly as you can. Uh, point out one more thing at the bottom before I move on. You and your spouse are equal partners. Whose responsibility is it to make sure that you guys have adequate life insurance? Answer would be both of you together. Uh, in, in the professional work that I do outside the university, I, I hear one comment almost more than anything else dealing with this that's tragic, particularly from young women who have gone through difficult experiences who simply say, I thought my husband was taking care of it all. Most households in the US, women actually control the finances. I think it should be co-managed. These are things that should be dealt with, talked about openly and honestly, and you and your spouse ought to be on the same page when, uh, when thinking about these things and making these decisions. Okay, uh, employee benefits, a good benefits package can be better than a 40% raise. I'll tell you that the benefits package that I have right now is, is equal to, in fact, more than 40% of my current salary. The benefits package is wonderful. It's something that you should think about when you're out there reviewing job opportunities and looking for that first job. As far as retirement is, con is concerned, a defined contribution plan Okay, that is where there is a set contribution made on your behalf or with your matching dollars, usually every month. You've, you've heard about these. Often a 401k plan is the most common. Here's how it works. You put in 3% of your salary and your boss will put in an additional 3%. You have their instant doubling of your resources. Now, you have to manage that. And if you manage it properly and it grows to a wonderful sum, you'll be able to retire and serve missions and do all kinds of great things. If you don't take advantage of it, 
or you manage it poorly, then there's no safety net for you. Uh, there is, incidentally, it's called Social Security. Wonderful safety net, please note the sarcasm. Uh, next options, uh, defined benefit plans. These are by and large disappearing in the last two decades, over 85% of the defined benefit plans are gone. You've heard of these though from perhaps your parents or grandparents. My grandfather worked for a certain company for the majority of his career up in Salt Lake City. He worked for them and after 30 years of service he retired and they send him a monthly check. Okay, so instead of the contribution amount being defined, it's the benefit portion that's defined. The companies take on the risk. Okay, and again, those are by and large disappearing in favor of the defined contribution 401k types. Uh, employee contribution also look for things like uh, Roth or traditional plans. I'm assuming you went over this somewhat in the investing module. You understand the difference between a Roth plan, pay taxes now, don't have to pay taxes on anything later. We like those, especially if you're in a very low tax bracket versus the traditional one. Uh, and there are both Roth and traditional versions of 401ks, which your employer may offer. Uh, also look for all the other types of profit sharing and bonus plans. There are many different types that employees will offer and you should consider all of those as part of your benefits package. When you look to healthcare, an HMO is a health maintenance organization. A PPO is a pre preferred provider organization. These are deals that your employer may have with groups of doctors or hospitals to give you specialized coverage for things that you may need. A health savings account allows you to accumulate money in, a, in an account that's taxed specially. Like you don't have to pay taxes on it as long as you accumulate it under certain rules and use it to pay for qualified health expenses. So if you get one of these high deductible plans that I mentioned a little bit ago, an HSA, a health savings account, is a good counterpart to it. The deductible is high, but here you have a tax advantaged way to save up to cover the difference in case you need to. Uh, anecdotally, I would add that the trend is moving that direction because of the rise in costs of health insurance. Many employers that I'm working with are moving towards high deductible plans because they're more affordable, but offering their employees a chance to engage in an HSA. Uh, flexible spending, similar in some ways to an HSA, uh, allows you to take some money out of your paycheck as long as it goes towards your health care. Uh, well, last but not least here is group life. This is a life insurance plan often offered through your employer where you are pooled together with the people that you're employed with. They can offer, depending on the circumstance, some really good savings over other types of plans. How do you know? Go to your employer if they offer it to you, check the price, and then go check a similar plan on the open market. If it's more beneficial to be, for you to be with the group plan, that's where you ought to be. If it's cheaper and more, uh, more beneficial on the open market, that's the direction that you would go. Uh, tuition reimbursement, obviously we're at a university, so this is one. Uh, but many employers are actually these days paying for master's degrees and advanced education. That's something that you should look for in your employment too, just to see if it's offered. To summarize, we're at the end. Financial perspectives, tithing. Pay the Lord first and be honest with him in all that you do. Uh, insurance basics, the principles of buying insurance. Remember that we're trying to cover in a very broad way things that have a low frequency of occurrence but a very high economic impact. The things that aren't likely to happen but would be quite devastating if they did. Personal insurance to protect your family and to make sure that their needs are met. Life, disability, and health for property insurance, home and auto, to make sure that you've got your coverage there where you need it. And also add in liability insurance. And then especially as you're moving from job to job and moving out, uh, make sure that you're looking for the employee benefits and seeing what types of packages your employees may offer, or employers may offer, excuse me. Uh, family home evening suggestions. Uh, review sections of personal finance for dummies. No fault in using something that's simple or has a silly title, okay? Simple is actually very good most of the time. 
uh, go ahead and sit down with your spouse and do some online comparisons for auto insurance. See if you can save money. Just make sure again that you're doing an apples to apples comparison. Uh, call a couple of competitors, check for quotes on life, health if it's applicable, disability if it's applicable, uh, home and auto, make sure that you're getting the best possible rates. Uh, determine how much personal and property insurance you need. And so that would be a process of going through looking at your home, seeing what the value is, looking at your car, seeing what the values are, seeing if you need comprehensive or collision, the different types of, uh, of uh, resources there. To, to sum it all up, again, I know we're a little over time, so I appreciate those that have stuck with us the whole time that we've been here. So this is the end of your sixth module. The, uh, the, the process, as you're aware, has been built and designed to do one thing. You'll notice there have been no sales pitches. We've avoided talking about specific companies to the degree possible. The hope here is that you can simply take the information that's been presented and that you can use it to stabilize yourselves and your family so that you can accomplish all that the Lord has intended for you to accomplish, so that you can do His will, so that you can serve where and when He needs you to serve, that your family can be protected and happy, even in the midst of difficult circumstances that we live in. Life is not easy. It's not supposed to be. It's part of the processes that we work through trials and challenges and things like that. But the six modules that we've presented have been designed, in our view, to give you the best perspective and the best advice that we can give you so that you can live happy, wonderful lives that are guided by the Spirit. And I'll close all six modules by sharing these things with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.